Hello and welcome to another visual podcast gravel race recap thingy. Still not really sure what to call these, but the one we released last week from Mid-South was a huge hit. So I thought we'd go back to my first race of the year, Graveler Series number one, Santa Vi Gravel, three-day stage race in Girona, Spain, where I based for the winter. Ironically, this quote-unquote training race was one of the most competitive probably that I'll do all year. Up here on the left, we have Hugo Drechu, who was Marathon National Champion of France a couple of years ago. Nathan Haas there on my right. This uh, announcer was quite a legend as well. Check this out. Let's go party, he says. Chad Haga shoots across there. Petr Vakoc, Jasper Okaloon, stacked field, almost 30 countries represented in this field. There's Hans Becking, who just won a stage at the Cape Epic and wore the leader's jersey for a day. Shout out to him for an awesome, awesome Cape Epic. I really enjoyed training with him over the winter, some on the mountain bike. Okay, so the format of this stage one was about two minutes of flat jockeying for position on pavement and then straight into like a 15 minute wall of dirt road climb. Not always a wall, bit steppy, um, but positioning would be key in a race this short. They called it a prologue, but it was a mass start. Crazy format, never done anything like this. And boy, I have a lot to learn still when it comes to positioning in racing in Europe, but I'm enjoying learning. There is a lot to learn. In the US, you know, it's really all about legs and tactics. And in Europe, it's about legs, tactics, and positioning. In the US, I've picked up this habit of kind of riding on the edge of the road to move up. But here, you know, there's so much road furniture. Like you're definitely not moving up on the left or hopping off into the dirt there on the left when there's this massive cement ditch thingy. Oh, one other quick note. Uh, we've got some number metrics on the left there. That was just one piece of feedback y'all gave from the Mid-South if you'd like to see numbers. So there you can see that. Um, bit of a scrum here. I'm already, you know, a little on edge about the dynamics, the washing machine effect, but I'm already picking up new things every time I do one of these races about how to comfortably navigate these bunches. One of the things is, I don't know if you could overhear that, but the communication that happens, everyone's shouting out those little speed bumps. We're already almost to the point where we're gonna make that right-hand turn uh, onto the climb proper. We got Maria DeMarchi here in front of me of ultra distance fame. Honestly, someone who doesn't get enough credit for uh, his his more normal, quote unquote, normal distance gravel races. I believe he was 11th or 12th at Gravel Worlds last year, just a spot behind his brother, Alessandro DeMarchi uh, of Jayco. Mattia did spend some time in the uh, world tour ranks as well riding for Androni Giacatoli, I believe. So we're on to the climb proper here. I'm already thinking about moving up. Quick head count, I'm like 20, 25th wheel, which is not ideal with only 15 minutes of racing left on a very tight, twisty climb with riders at such a high level. Um, I know that, you know, this field's going to explode. There's gonna be gaps to jump across, all kinds of things to navigate. So ideally I'd be going into the bottom of this climb in the top 10, but of course that's where everyone wants to be. And with the level being so high and, you know, me still having some things to learn positioning wise over in Europe, I didn't quite execute on that part of the plan. But as you'll see, I do my best to manage the effort alongside getting in position here. So sitting on, while well, it's bouncing around, if you look over there on the power, up to 500, 600 here to get around a couple of guys get into a little bit better position. But one thing, what I was gonna say is one thing that I did not really expect about this race is how surgy it would be. You expect a little bit of that with the fact that it's got steep parts and then some flatter parts, but the, the race dynamics, the battling for position, the slipperiness of the surface, it made for a very inconsistent effort, I would say, which creates a good training effect to be fair but it wasn't exactly the 17 minute power test that I was expecting. Pretty high speed here, so 4% grade, but we're going 17 miles an hour, so there's absolutely a big drafting effect. This is not a spot where I'm thinking about passing. This is an opportunity to let the power come down a little bit, let the heart rate come down a little bit, and save some bullets for when I do need to jump across gaps, when I do need to have something in the legs for the really, really gnarly last you know, five, six minutes where it's over 20% grade a lot of times. Over here on the right, we have a rider on the reverb uh, race team. One of the things that I've noticed racing gravel in Europe is how many teams are popping up. Right here, we have a groove rider. They had about five riders in the race. The new Pond Normal team had, gosh, probably close to 10 riders in the race. 
Lots of different teams. My buddy Jasper, though, uh, who you can kind of see over there on the right, Jasper Okaloon, who does race a good bit over these days. On the Canyon Collective team, more of a, I guess, traditional privateer type racer, you might say. 21 miles an hour, a little bit of flatter part here. Again, an opportunity to let the power come down a bit, sit in the wheels, save something for when you really need bullets. With a field this competitive and level this high, I really have to be careful with my effort. You know, there are riders out there who could probably ride a little more flamboyantly and just kind of charge up to the front. But, you know, for me personally, with these spikes over 500 watts as is just sitting in the wheels, uh, I really had to pace myself. I had great fitness for this race, actually. Um, and we didn't know exactly, you know, how the rest of the, the field would be riding. Of course, you never really do. but. I figured for sure I could be top 10 in this race and, and being top five would be even better and certainly within the realm of possibility. Um, so with that goal in mind, sitting 20th wheel right here really isn't ideal, but at 180 beat, 182 beats per minute already, I would be very unwise to try to sprint around the outside. So again, on some of these higher speed sections, these flatter sections really just using the opportunity to save some bullets for later in the race. One other thing you'll notice about racing in Europe is they're so comfortable riding really, really close to each other. And you have to get comfortable with that. You have to be able to conserve energy and make passes by using momentum. And so much of that is being willing to shoot little gaps. Nathan Haas with a nice pass there moving up. Definitely something I'm continuing to work on, but really Honestly, enjoying working on. It's a whole different ball of... Oh, man. So that guy snapped his crank. And uh, that was actually not necessarily a key moment of the race, but it was definitely a, a memorable element because it gets really strung out here. Almost 800 watts over that little rise now, and it's fully strung out. So the, the slightest little interruptions there... I mean, there was no crash. That guy just came to a stop, but it really completely lined out the field. You can see the front of the race is, is way up there, fully lined out. I'm 20, 25th wheel at best right here. But again, definitely not a time to move up when we're going 20 miles an hour. And you'd just be pushing a lot of wind to come around the outside. So I'm trying to use some momentum here, get a couple of riders. But that's what everybody's thinking. <laughs> so no passes coming easily in Europe or especially in a 17 minute hill climb format. You can see how lumpy it is. We've got these little water bars, kicks up to 8%, 9%, 10%. You can kind of see based on the way people's hips are rocking at this point that guys are working hard. The race is definitely starting to get real at this point, seven minutes in or whatever we are. And you can see some cracks just starting to form. Some, some little gaps are just starting to open and this is where I'm kind of telling myself pay attention you know this is this is where you can't let big, big gaps open if you want to have a good result on this day I'm not too stressed about huge time gaps for the GC component it's such a short format that really the only way that you could lose huge time is if you blow up so while it would be nice to get a great result I'm actually thinking way more about maybe just riding a tiny bit more conservatively and making sure that the, the time gaps stay small because this is a three-day stage race. Riders out of the saddle. I mean, just <laughs> the, the wattage there, 500, 600, well over 600. Uh, just so surgy. And then you get a little bit of respite here where it drops down below 400. Really try to take advantage of those moments to recover a little bit. But at only 17 minutes long, um, it's, it's really just, it, it had a bit of a mountain bike feel, this, this race, which was, which was cool. It was, I've never done a race like this, and it was a fun format. Using a steeper section here where there's not as much drafting effect to try to make up a few spots, and now people are officially starting to drop anchors. So there's a proper gap that I need to ride across. Jasper is up there, looking to close to him. By the way... Uh, done a podcast with him. I should kind of shout out all the people that I've done podcasts with in this race. It's kind of funny. I think that'll become a theme. Now 270-something 270, 270 episodes in, 
I've done a podcast with a lot of the, the guys I get to race against, which is cool. Freddie Ovette there right in front, someone I have not done a podcast with yet, but certainly should. Someone who I race with a decent amount, also based in Spain these days. 180 beats per minute and not exactly easily closing down this gap in front of me. I get caught in not a sweet position right here, honestly. 16, 17, 18 miles an hour, 19 miles an hour. I would really love to be right on someone's wheel here. So I'm kind of feathering the effort. You can see I let the watts drop a little bit because it's just not worth charging at 400, 500 watts and towing people across that gap behind me. Just try to let momentum do it. As we get into a steeper section again here, well, no, it continues to roll. So now we have an almost like a little descent. So this guy comes around me, which honestly was great. I was grateful for that because uh, it's a little, he's kind of filling in the gap there in front of me. So he did some work for me there. Thank you, Panormal guy with wild wheels. 181 beats per minute. I'm not fully maxed at this point, but not far off to be fair. Keeping a tiny bit in reserve, uh, but it's uh, you know that's definitely close to definitely close to absolute all-out threshold. This is a steep part now. 15%. You can see everyone is starting to think about their own individual races a little bit more. It's much less group racing. You can see the lead group starting to roll away there. And at this point, there's kind of two groups solidifying. So that front group of five is like Petr Vakoc, Hans Becking, Hugo Drechu, Joe Laverick, actually, who was at Mid-South. And then that second group with um, David Lozano of Novo Nordisk, Jasper, Jasper Okalun. Uh, Lawrence Nason, actually, who was on AG2R last year and has made his full-time switch over to gravel. Sneaking through a tight little gap there. At this point, I'm starting to get the sense that that front group is, is rolling away in a way that I would have to put in such a ridiculously massive effort that I would definitely explode on the last five minutes if I tried to just smash up to the front. So now I'm mostly just focusing on the second group. Um, and, and kind of, I'm going to use the word gently, carefully, making my way across to it, really respecting the last five or six minutes of this climb, kind of using this rider in front of me to hopefully tow me across a little bit. At 11 miles an hour, there's definitely still a little bit of draft going on. At this point, I've made up enough spots to be kind of knocking on the door of a top 10, maybe sitting 12. You can see the leaders going around the left-hand turn there, so... That's about a 10, 12 second gap, which doesn't sound like a lot, but we're all pretty much on the limit here. Just passing riders requires huge effort. Again, we're sitting on 450, 500 watts going around that tight switchback and then straight into this wall. At this point in the race, I'm starting to set kind of individual spots and individual riders as goals. Um, rather than thinking about, you know, I want to get up to that group, it's more let's just chip off a rider here, chip up, off a rider there, get to the top as efficiently as possible and, and uh, kind of limit the damage to the, to the leaders. You can, again, you can see them kind of through the trees there right, there, right up there going around the turn. The gap still isn't huge. I finally kind of made it to the second group. Ben Thomas coaching, getting some great TV time here at the moment. Nice work, Ben. Making use of his strong legs to promote his coaching company. Nice guy out of the UK. Nathan Haas with an efficient pass there on the inside, getting two of us at once. From this point on, there's really not a whole lot of hiding. Uh, it doesn't really ever go below like 12%, and you'll see it only get steeper. Heart rate seems to be pretty well stuck at 181 beats per minute. Nay, uh, sorry, Chad Haga moving up there on the right. Also someone I've done a podcast with. You can check that out at the link right here. The, the grade does ease off just a little bit here. I forgot 4%, which is nice. I'll take it. Watts get to drop down below 300 for the first time in a little bit, which is really nice. Clear a little bit of that lactate that we've been building. 
Ben with an interesting move there, honestly, kind of going for the pass on a flatter, higher speed section. Personally, I would have waited until the speed drops, like right in here, to make that pass. But actually, as you'll come to see, um, making passes on these really steep sections, and, and I bring that up to say, in hindsight, what Ben did there to actually make a pass might have been a better tactic uh, because the road gets so narrow and we start running into some of the stragglers from the women's race and the speed gets so low on these really steep pitches. I mean, this is so steep that they they uh, paved it with cement um, in order to, to maintain this road so it doesn't just get so chewed up that you can't get up at 20% grade here, 21%, and it's just kind of slow motion racing now. Lawrence Nason there on the right, trying to make the pass. Jasper swerving around a little bit from the effort. Everyone is, is very much on their limit now. At this point with, I don't know, four or five minutes left to race, I'm thinking a lot less about, maybe not even four or five minutes left, more like three minutes left. Starting to go for broke here. Like this is kind of this little flat bit where we're dropping below 400 watts or so is sort of the last moment to to gather your thoughts before the mad dash to the top. Some pretty well placed fans slash hecklers here on this quarter. Pretty fun. If you look, you can see a T Rex and Allison Jackson and her Canadian national champs kit. Winner of Roubaix last year. Good luck to her in the next few days. She races Roubaix again. So steep, so steep. I'm finally going to try to make this pass around Jasper. Uh, he kind of shuts me down on the left. I don't think he was trying to block me per se. Everyone's just kind of trying to get up at this point, try to go on the right. But like I said, we've got some of the, the stragglers in the women's race. And then the surface really starts to get chewed up here. So one thing I, I did underestimate a bit is when everyone is going flat out and you're sitting on 450, 500, just trying to crawl your way past your competitors and everyone is able to put out big power, these rough sections, those exposed rock bits, add so much resistance and kill so much speed. I mean, we're down at five miles per hour. Like the amount of power, the, the amount of extra power required to get around one of, you, one of your fellow competitors at this point would just be huge. Cole Patton there on the right with some savage heckling. Thanks, buddy. So this is David, David Lozano in front of me. He's been on the Nova Nordisk Pro Conti team for quite a few years. I think I have the legs to get around him here, maybe, and then kind of run into more of this really rough choppy stuff and have to bail out to the smoother line behind him. And that really was my last opportunity to get behind him. So, or sorry, get around him. So Chad Haga and Nathan Haas are disappearing, getting four or five seconds on us right around the corner. The finish is right up ahead, last little surge. And I end up rolling across here, I think like eighth-ish position. There's Gerard, had a class mark, chapeau buddy. Uh, really awesome racing you're putting together. Of course, Traka is their, their most famous one, but the Santa Vai one is getting quite a name for itself. Absolutely crushing souls. There's Nathan there laying on the ground. Chad looking a little tired. Um, but yeah, that was a that was a good time. Great workout. Um, shout out to Vakoch for winning. Joe Laverick for second. And uh, we will check back in with part two of this Santavai race recap in the next few days. Stage two. Thanks for watching and uh, we'll catch you for the next one.